Well, it's almost spring and we haven't done many videos on the farm stuff here in quite some time. So uh, it's snowing outside, which is fantastic. We're supposed to get about eight inches of snow here, but that gives us time to actually sit down and do a PowerPoint presentation um, of how things have been going here the last couple of years on this, all this regenerative egg stuff. So on our YouTube channel, we get a lot of questions from you guys on how things are going or how some of the compost extract stuff has worked versus the bacterial. And I'm going to cover all that in this video. So let's just get to it. <laughs> so I am, I am excited here to share with you guys where we've gone on our journey through regenerative egg. We started in 2020 really shifting directions. That's the year we quit. Um, we, for you guys that don't actually follow our YouTube channel, um, on a side note there, we do have a channel on YouTube. You can follow videos of us as we go along with all these different regenerative practices we've installed and, and what we've learned and kind of how it's going up here in a pretty arid environment in northern Montana. But since we quit the egg retail in 2020, I have kind of started focusing on how to bring the land back to life. We've had some trials. There's been some difficulty pushing stuff like extract through the drill or starting some fires, which I'll get into later in this presentation. But all in all, we are in a much more positive, low-cost direction than we were four years ago. So that's what this video is going to cover, is kind of what we changed and, and where we've gone with it. So just really quick, like, um, we have three different entities that we kind of operate under. That Happy Steer Ranch thing you see at the top, that's just our grass-fed beef um, farm-to-table type marketing thing. That, that I could cover in a whole different presentation. That's a difficult business, but it has worked well for moving cattle through at a higher margin than we could get through the sale ring. And we have an insurance office that we started 20 years ago that makes enough income that it's able to subsidize some things that we're doing on the farm. So all of these things are kind of supporting each other. We're able to try some things that maybe some of you guys would be a little hesitant to do because we can tolerate a little more risk. But all in all, I'm really happy with the direction we're going in. And just really quickly, if you if you haven't followed us before, we did egg retail. We sold chemicals. I was an agronomist for 20 years. I walked a lot of fields. I was really good at killing things. And I could see as the science developed in this that a lot of this that we were doing was negative um, to the long-term sustainability of our land and the cost of farming. So, so our goals are to do everything we can to keep the soil covered try to mimic nature to reduce our costs and workload while improving the soil. So two things there, there's things we can do like changing calving dates that really change the workload of, of an enterprise. There's also things we can do to get nutrients cycling better with biology to reduce our costs. And so the focus of this, all this regen stuff should be healthier soil, reduced costs and reduced labor to some extent, I think. So, Figure out how to make a continuous crop regenerative system work in an arid climate, which I'll get into our arid part here on the next slide. And then we don't base long-term decisions off of one year's experience. So there's things like cover crop, we know we're gonna get a yield drag in this low of a rainfall area the next year. That doesn't mean that it's not worth doing it from a soil health standpoint, as long as we can put cattle over it and stuff like that. So, so just a real quick rehash of where we've been at. We've been in a D2 or worse drought in our area. so. If you guys can see my little pointer here, we are up in northern Montana. So we would be right up in the north of Great Falls, about two hours up here. In this area where the pointer's at, we've been in a D2 or D3 drought since 21. So we started this process in 20. That was a pretty good year, like eight inches of rain, so not a lot. But we've been in a pretty bad drought. But regardless of that, things seem to be working and definitely going in the right direction. So just real quick, this is our yearly rain from the 2000s forward to about 2016 we were averaging 10 to 12 inches of rain a year and then from 2016 on the spigot just kind of shut off here and we've been averaging six to seven inches of rain since from 2017 all the way up till now so pretty sustained long drought but during this transition we quit fallowing we added a lot of diverse cropping in here we've been cutting inputs and things are improving even though we're in a drought scenario like that um, one of the things we have to be cognizant of is it always, if it's going to quit raining up here, it quits in the middle of June. So trying to make things like warm season grasses work in our cover crops, unless that cycle breaks, it's somewhat pointless to throw some of these things in our cover if it's not going to rain after the middle of June. So we've sort of changed our focus on getting as much biomass as we can while the rains actually still fall. Um, we are in a rocky environment too. This is one of our fields. This would be obviously a little bit on the rockier end of things, but all of our fields have rocks in them. Some maybe half as much as this, some very much like this. So that 
adds to the challenge of in, in, uh, installing things like practices like using a disc drill where you're running over a lot of rocks or the stripper header where we might start some fires. So, so I always like to cover the agronomy part of this before I get into the why part of what we're doing. So the, here's the soil before we messed it up. Well, before we came out here and homesteaded and broke this stuff out, all of this stuff was functioning under the soil. We didn't have to add stuff to make things grow, right? We had bison grazing grass that were then um, dropping manure back onto that grass, stimulating it by grazing. All of the things were working. And we came out then and broke the soil up. And the first thing that happened when we homesteaded this and the tore the ground up is we affected the sugars being fed into the plant. We cut off right away. The fungus, as you rip a plow through the ground, is ripping those fungal networks up. And we really put a hamper on that part too. But we still, even after all that, with this native range and we broke it out, we were able to grow pretty good crops here for 15 to 20 years without any inputs just because there was all that stored energy and, and free nutrients in the soil. At some point, though, we hit some droughts and we started fallowing. And when we start fallowing, we basically are starving this whole, whole soil food web under the ground for an entire year, right? We cut, we're taking sunlight normally in a green plant, photosynthesizing in the plant, splitting water up and using that energy from the sunlight and turning it into sugars to feed not only the plant, but the biology underneath it, we now understand. If we're following the whole year, not only do we have bare ground, but we are not feeding that biology or any of the soil food web under the ground. So after we started following and we had tore this ground up for a while, we couldn't grow a crop without adding inputs. So we started adding things like anhydrous to get the nitrogen back in the cycle, insecticides because these plants are sick and we've got bugs attacking them. Then pretty soon you start doing things like just using insecticide willy-nilly on seed just because you might potentially have a wire worm problem, which ramps up more damage to the soil food web. So long story short, as you watch this, there's things like the neonics on the seed tree, which would be macho and gaucho, the cruisers, all those insecticides that are put with your seed tree. Those are really hard on a lot of the stuff that's within the soil and other things like bees, because it's systemic in the plant, they're finding that it's difficult on that. That's linked to colony collapse disorder. I am I sold millions of dollars worth of seed tree and fungicide in my life, and now I realize how detrimental that was to the soil food web. So when we start having broke down soil food web problems, we don't have functioning soil. We, we see the same crop year after year. We're forced to use things like fungicides, but the more of that stuff we use, the worse it gets, right? It's just like you got on a prescription drug that caused one problem in your body, so you get on another one, and then they add something else because that, those two together caused the problem. It's ramped itself up now to where we're in a very expensive farming situation. So what really stopped us from the egg retail thing, so in, we still have people that fallow around here, and the Roundup, the glyphosate would no longer kill the weeds in the fallow because it was resistant, the kosher especially was resistant to glyphosate. So at the end, about the last year that we were egg retailing, they started using Paraquat on fallow, and we were doing multiple passes of Paraquat, which is the most lethal chemical that we sold in our warehouse at that point. They were using that on bare ground multiple times a year. And that, that was kind of an aha moment. I mean, at the same time, we started learning more about the soil food web and about life in the fields and how important this was. But when we get to the point that we're applying a chemical that has and LD50 to the point that less than a teaspoon will kill a human, and we're spraying that over this entire ecosystem, it's obvious that's not a sustainable system, right? So, so that's kind of what spurred us, or spurred us along the switch direction. So the other thing that happens when we've now killed off all of the soil food web so that none of this stuff is functioning within itself is we, were we are now responsible for providing all the inputs that the plant needs. So it's to be very expensive to farm if you have to apply every pound of nitrogen that you need for your barley to grow, let's say, or apply all the phosphorus that the plant needs to grow because we're not extracting any from the soil, or we're getting disease because we have some broken stuff. So I could see this was not a sustainable system long term because I was involved in it, right? I sold that stuff for a long time. So the first thing we did on our farm then to try and fix this problem is we eliminated the fallow. And Obviously, just not having the ground starved for a year has to help something. That being said, if you switch to recropping and keep intensively farming the way that you were doing and put a bunch of fungicides down and are putting high salt fertilizer through the drill, you're actually amplifying the problem, not making it better because at least in fallow, 
every other year that ground got a break from a lot of these things, right? Like the fungicides that were on the seed tree or the fungicides you may have sprayed in the crop. If you go from half crop, cropping it every other year to cropping it every year, applying fungicides and high salt fertilizer and all this, those are the systems that break or that don't work. And so I just want to really emphasize, I have neighbors tell me stuff like, well, I got to quit recropping that ground because I'm, it needs a it needs a break or it needs a rest. Well, no, it should never need a rest. The only reason it needs a rest is from the things that we are doing to it, right? So, so if you're a guy that tried recropping before and it wasn't working, but you kept doing all the same things, then that that definitely is why. The more of those inputs that we put in the ground, the worse your situation is going to get, and that system is going to break down because it's it's a high dollar thing to do. You're hammering away. Um, on biology all the time. So the first thing we did is eliminate the fallow. The same time we eliminated seed treat, um, or pretty close to the same time in here, this was probably 2016. I think 2018 we eliminated seed treat because now we understand, you know, what's going on. So when we eliminate the fallow, we start feeding sugars back into the ground all the time, at least while that crop is green. So that immediately starts to ramp the bacteria back up. It gives um, the soil food web a chance to start repairing itself. And then obviously the next step that we could see that we needed to take was eliminating seed treat. So we quit treating all the seed. We were putting biological stuff on the seed, which at least helped bridge the gap in there, I think, of that not getting diseased in this transition. We quit using fungicides. So we haven't used a fungicide on this place now in probably 10 years, I guess. No more insecticides. I'm a huge um, pro- opponent, I should say. I'm totally against using neonics on seed and that multiple reasons. That stuff has a really long half-life in the soil. So one of the studies that I saw in a not a very well-functioning soil had an eight-year half-life of a neonic in the soil. Those are the machos and gaucho type things that are, are paired with your seed to control wire worms. It's going to take a long time to flush this stuff out of there. And if we keep doing it, it's just going to keep compounding the problem, right? And we quit putting high salt fertilizer through the drill. So we're not putting any starter fertilizer down at all through the drill at this point. That the first couple of years, we did have some crops that had some nutrient cycling problems. And I'll get into addressing how we're, I think you could eliminate that part in your transition if you're going to go this route. So the other thing that really helps when you eliminate the seed tree part, especially like the neonics, is it helps the wire worm or the the uh, earthworms and the bees and those things start to come back into this cycle as well. And then um, everything, when we get insects repopulating in the field, which insects are actually a positive thing, not a negative thing for the most part in these systems, then the birds come back, they're eating the insects, and you get birds, they're cycling some of that, and the birds come back and eat the weed seeds. There's a lot of good things that happen when you get this whole soil food web cycling the way that it should. And then how we're trying to fix it is we're going to apply biology, or we have already applied biology back to the soil with compost teas and extracts. Um, We're using some bacterial tea, too, to help bridge the nutrient gap, which I'll get into going forward here. So when we do that, those compost teas have all of the soil food web in them, basically. If you you have a biodiverse compost, like you would get in a Johnson sewer, you've got a high fungal count, a lot of um, upper-level stuff like the anthropods, the nematodes, and amoeba, that kind of stuff, we get cycling start to happen, which is what our end goal should be here, right? So we get out of the way of all this stuff. We're also trying to inoculate the soil by putting it back down with the drill or with the sprayer, if it's easier for you to do it that way. And um, so then that leads into all parts of the farm working together for us. So we've got increased hawk population around here. I think part of that is just getting more diversity back in the field and and getting more birds around and things like that. Um, The coyotes, we ranch as well. We calve cows out here for 20 years or whatever on our place. Never once have we had a coyote kill a calf. Now, I'm not saying that there's not times that predators ramp up beyond what's a reasonable level and they shouldn't be addressed. But in general, We used to have farmers come in that didn't even have livestock. They were shooting all the coyotes on their place, and then they'd come in and buy gopher poison. And and we got to have a more holistic approach of this stuff. It's silly to be spending money on gopher poison when you could have things like coyotes and foxes out helping control this stuff. And in our cattle end of things, we got that risk even farther away of coyotes doing anything to the cattle by just shifting our calving date to May when there's whole other group of food sources that are way easier than a calf or a coyote to attack, right? So 
in May, you've got gophers and rabbits and all sorts of other food sources that, that a coyote can access. And then when we're calving, the coyotes are following the cows around in our intensive grazing system. They're cleaning up the afterbirth, but they're leaving the cattle alone. So I, I've changed my view of a lot of things in farming, mostly because if you start seeing it from a holistic standpoint, like how everything is helping itself out, you realize there's usually a purpose for every organism that shows up within this system. And if we get out of the way, they kind of balance themselves out. So the other thing is that this has caused me to look at farming through a different lens since I've dwelled more into the science end of this and less into the killing everything like we did in the agronomy. So usually if we had a grasshopper problem, we would go spray the grasshoppers, but we never would consider, even though that was supposed to be part of our, uh, integrated pest management thing, right? The stuff that was out there while well, the grasshoppers were there too. And what almost inevitably happens in a, in a high grasshopper count year is you get a lot of crickets and black beetles. And those crickets and black beetles are for the most part very ben beneficial to our farming system. They eat weed seeds, but the big thing is they eat grasshopper eggs too. And if we go spray those grasshoppers out, we are killing all those crickets and the predators out too. And you you always have a ramp up faster of the prey than you do of the predator species. And so it's going to take a lot of years to get back into balance if we keep whacking away at it like that. And sometimes it's just better to let things go. And so there's things like flea beetles on canola. If you get a good ladybug population out there, they really help control those flea beetles. The other thing is if you're seeding canola with the full seed treat package on there, and you're putting a bunch of fertilizer down with it, you're getting really low bricks counts in the plant, of course that plant's going to get attacked by um, things like flea beetles. So this intense farming system that we created with all these inputs is also creating plants with low bricks or low sugar levels in them that are just attracting insects. And I, I think we can figure out ways to grow things like canola without using a bunch of insecticide. We're, we're trying again this year on our farm, so we'll let you know how that goes. And the last thing is a top one is a kosher plant. I found a lot of research on the inter internet about kochia detoxifying soil. They actually were using that plant to um, reclaim mining sites back in the 60s before we just focused on killing it. And it was really good at, um, at remediating soils that were high in cadmium and lead and arsenic. And, and this plant is really good at growing in tough environments and detoxifying the soil. And I think the reason we have such a flush of kochia in our system is because we have laden the soil with so many things that need remediated in there that the kosher is trying to do a job. And, and we just, I know we can't just let it go in the crop ground, but I'm going to get into how we're using perennial crops and letting the kosher go the first year to try and remediate these soils. And, and I think if we look at that plant from that standpoint, it'll help us understand why things show up in our system. So last point on that, we just really need to start more focusing on why is this weed flushing into our system? Not so much, how do we kill it? It doesn't mean that we're not going to go out and not control the kosher, let's say, before we seed. Of course, we're going to do that. But if it's still showing up all the time in our system, it means something, right? Like we need to understand why that's there. So we eliminated about $162 an acre of inputs in our system. Some of that was stuff like cash lease on fallow ground. This is compared to our old crop fallow system that we were doing. Um, a lot of it's being able to cut nitrogen because the soil's cycle, cycling better. We uh, don't have spray for oats anymore because we're not disturbing the ground, stirring those oats up. Plus, higher insect counts help because they eat oat seeds. So once we get this working, which we have now since 2018, we've made this shift, we're spending way less money per cropped acre than we were back in our intensive farming type system. So the next thing question we always get is, aren't we mining the soils, Right. Especially on the phosphorus end, when I was doing agronomy work, you'd always tell people, well, you got to put back at least as much phosphorus as the crop's going to take because we're only showing seven parts per million in your soil test and we've depleted the soil and there's just basically no more phosphorus to get out of there. Well, now I see that's total bull because as we're getting <clears throat> the biology cycling, we have not applied phos now for four years at all. No starter, no phosphorus at all applied in the system on the same field here we went from 18 parts per million of phosphorus back in 2018 which this is one of our higher fields we didn't apply any starter then from 2020 all the way up now through 2023 and we are up to about 57 parts per million of free floating phosphorus in there just by using or allowing phosphorus solubilizing 
biology to do its thing within the soil. There is um, a large amount of phosphorus banked in the top six inches of the soil, which is what we always study, that could be released that we could use. But then if you start using like brassica, deep-rooted crops that are good at solubilizing phosphorus from deep and bringing it back up to the surface, turnips and radishes and a cover crop, another example of that, if we can access that hole, let's say we can get six feet down on the soil profile, which is totally doable with the brassica if we got moisture to do that, and we can pull phosphorus up and deposit it back on top. If you look at it from that standpoint, there is enough phosphorus in the soil to sustain us for probably thousands of years, even with removing crops and shipping them off. So, and what will happen eventually? Sure, we will have mined this stuff to the point that phosphorus needs replaced back in there, but we are not to that point yet, I don't think. So, so that's what we're finding. That was one of the most alarming things from my old agronomy days versus now, and, and what we can see happening in our soils is that we quit applying a product and the free floating form of that product in the soil or the plant accessible part is increasing, not decreasing in there. So um, if you watch Christine Jones's video, she will tell you the first thing to cut is phosphorus out of your system. You can look up Christine Jones and the phosphorus paradox on YouTube. There's a really good video on this. She is totally right from what I can see. And we got another neighbor that tried using this uh, bacterial tea that we made. He had the same results in a soil test this year too. So it's mind blowing the amount of money we probably spent on stuff just because it's tied up in the soil that we could access with biology. This is how our transition from regen egg till now. The dark green, the left bars was in 2018. That's our old farming system we were in when we were very intensive um, with fertilizer and chemical. As we get to the right, that's 23. After inflation even, we're still about $200,000 less in inputs than what we were using back in our old intense system that happened prior to inflation, right? So um, we made some substantial cuts in here, and in general, things are going better, not worse. Now, that's not to say we're not having a little bit of some yield drags and things like that maybe uh, versus what we potentially could have had in our old system, but the cost savings are so much that – if we hit multiple drought years where we're not putting these inputs down that we would have in a good year and we would have got no return on, in our kind of environment, <clears throat> this cost savings of, of reducing inputs and improving the soil is a bit of a no-brainer in my opinion. So uh, the other thing that we've learned now is that endophytes, actually this means biology living within a plant, right, inside a plant. Bacteria and fungus it can live with inside the plant. It's transported around in the plant with the phloem and the xylem, just like everything else is. And when the plant is finishing out, it takes a bunch of this biology and deposits it into its seed for the next crop to start on. So it's very important where you source your seed from. If you could find a really good regen place, probably locally, that would have local type biology in the seed, there'd be a lot of value in that. On the flip side, it's also a lot of value to us to keep seed, and that, that would be the reason, one of the reasons why, basically. And Gabe Brown had figured this out years ago. He just, and he's probably right to some extent, he, he said his seed was genetically adapting to his system. Well, it was probably genetically adapting not only to his system, but also as his biology ramped up, that, that biology was resident in the seed when it was germinating, too. And so very interesting, the science that's leading us down this path and how we're starting to understand how important having good biology in the plant is. So um, this is just a real quick system comparison between how we used to farm in a fallow system with high inputs, um, all the fertilizer we used to put down. If we did winter wheat, we'd do Olympus in the fall and then oftentimes gold sky in the spring to try and control cheatgrass, which we don't have to deal with cheatgrass anymore in our system either. As we quit applying as many nitrates on top, that starts to go away. But <coughs> Um, as a whole, it was $262 an acre to farm that way when I ran all the comparable costs versus $108 in our current system. So $153 an acre difference in cost between a fallow and a recrop system. That fallow system would have to yield 19 bushels more an acre at $8 a bushel in wheat. If we were at $5 wheat now, it would be substantially more than that. So Canadians have figured this out a long time ago that the fallow part doesn't make sense just from a cost standpoint, especially if you're paying for releasing land. There's really no way to make that cash flow as well as a diverse rotation. 
we are just starting to figure that out here because we're in a little tougher climber, but I, there is a lot of difference in the costs in these two systems, a regen system versus a crop fallow high input system anyways. So keeping the soil covered, that's the first part of this video. I'm gonna, in the first part of this video, we're gonna cover that. And a big part of that is making sure we have a high enough carbon to nitrogen ratio in our crop rotation. So what you guys are seeing here is on the left side of the screen, a crop rotation of chickpeas, then winter wheat. Oh, sorry, let me get to the next slide. So you're gonna see here, we on the left, we did chickpeas, then winter wheat, then yellow mustard, and then spring wheat. So what we did wrong here is we did any broadleaf crop, basically, that you're gonna grow for the most part, except for flax, if that falls in that category, but most of the other broadleaf crops, the pulses, the brassicas are low carbon. The grasses are high carbon. So we've got a broadleaf, a low carbon, a high carbon, a low carbon, and then a high carbon. So we've got two out of four years here on this left side. What we changed on the right side, this is in the exact same crop year these two things were growing, is we, we threw flax in with the chickpeas. So a high carbon crop like flax, winter wheat, then chickpeas and flax again and barley over here. So if we can do three out of four years of a high carbon crop and one year of a low carbon, we can keep cover like we have on the right side. If we stray from that, especially in our fragile system, we end up with this pitcher on the left side and we don't want that on the left side, right? We're not, the soil gets hot, it blows, we're not, um, protecting the biology and so this is more of what our normal crop rotation would be so we have spring wheat and then yellow mustard and winter wheat then spring wheat so we had a in this example three out of four years were a high carbon crop the yellow mustard was the only low carbon and after that second year of wheat look at the ground cover that we have left that would allow us to then seed a pulse crop in there or a brassica and still keep some cover after that so that stripper stubble um, versus draper stubble. So that stripper header is one of the best things we ever bought for our farm. Um, not only does it reduce our harvest costs, reduce the wear in the combine, but it leaves all of the stubble intact and just strips the seed off the top. What you're seeing on the left side is after a, about a 12 inch snowstorm. This is in our chickpea stubble that we cut with a flex header on that side. You can see we're about three inches up that mag light there and we buried the mag light in the middle of that field in the strip stubble. So uh, there was a, literally was in that, storm about an eight inch difference in snow catch because we always get wind usually with our snow here so this is that winter wheat then coming up in that field the next spring you can see the amount of cover in there for the winter wheat so incredibly good to have strips double to seed winter wheat into because it leaves so much wind protection and cover and snow catch for that um, another thing that we've becomes very apparent as you start cutting inputs in a system is the influence that organic matter or perennial cropping has in in a system like this. So what you're seeing here on the left side is a, an FSA map. As you can see on this map, this spot where my pointer is here was in CRP for about 10 to 15 years before we took over the farming from my dad. And to square this field up, we decided, well, we'll take this CRP out so we can just farm through this. And so we took it out and we sprayed it out. And 10 years later, this is in a drought year we had 26 bushel barley on the rest of this field and right to a line where that CRP was, we had 39 bushel barley with the exact same farming practices and this reduced input system. And we see this year after year. And so this really opened my eyes to what could we do with perennial cropping to try and fix some of this ground that we've spent 40 years messing up, right? And I, I think as we get to the end of this video, I'll discuss this, but that, that's gonna be our quickest path to fixing this is to pick fields perennial crop them for four or five years at least that gives us a break from the chemicals no fertilizer we can graze it and then we can put that back into crop ground and i think we'll see returns just like on this field 10 plus years out from giving that field a break from from all of the abuse that we've given it in the past and allowing it to be, build some organic matter so um direct seeding into crp that's a, a big win too so if you're taking a, a hay field out or crp we still have to spray stuff out, of course, which I'd like to figure out how not to use glyphosate. But what we do is we apply glyphosate in the fall. We'll spray that stuff down because that's the easiest time to kill perennial grasses as they're getting ready for winter. Just direct seed right into that stand of that stuff. And this shows you the peas on the right coming up into that direct seeded CRP. So th this was not touched with a tillage tool. It wasn't hayed. It just is deep seeded peas. I really like peas in CRP because 
And that kind of stuff, it's a grass heavy system. You're going to have too much carbon in there. So your nitrogen cycling won't be very well good. And you can seed peas a good three inches deep and they'll come out of ground just fine. So you can get below that duff layer. And um, we've had really good luck seeding pulse crops direct seeded into a long established grass stand after we spray it out. And this would be a similar way that we would cycle then that perennial stuff that we're going to seed in these fields back into crop production, basically. So there are some issues with having lots of stubble. I'm bunching a straw, so you basically have to have a disc drill if you're going to use a stripper header. Um, hair pitting can be an issue with the disc drill. If you seed at an angle to the previous year's row, just like at a 10% angle or 5% even, just so you're 90% of the time, then you're not in that that row with those wheat plants or whatever sticking up so you could hair pit into those. That little bit of an angle you see, that'll make a big difference in that disc drill. And the other thing we learned of the disc drill is go, if you were going an inch deep with barley or something with a hoe drill, go an inch and a half with the disc drill because you can go deeper with those without having any issues with it coming up. And that really helps eliminate the hair pinning issue too. Um, fire issues are another thing that comes up when you have a bunch of stubble. We don't drive any gas vehicles out in these fields anymore unless we absolutely have to. I burnt a side by side up as you can see on this slide here. We did have some drill sparked fires. That was from rocks sparking off the discs in our drill. That we addressed with slowing down, which is in another slide here, I think. And um, Then obviously pick as many rocks as we can. This just shows you some of the rocks that have been picked out of fields here just recently. And we've got some serious rocks we deal with. So we can't worry about the little things, but of course we pick the big ones. And then with seeding, we just slow down if it's overly dry. So if we get over five miles an hour and it's 80 degrees and it's 15% humidity, like when we're seeding in the fall, there's a pretty good chance with all these rocks and those discs sparking off of them, we're going to start a fire. We actually started a fire twice in the same field in a dry fall when we were trying to seed winter wheat. So now if it gets above 80 degrees, it gets below 15% humidity, we'll either quit or we just slow down. But speed is obviously a big factor in this stuff. The stripper header is what caused the combine spark fires that we had. Um, we had two or three of those actually now, I guess. They were all sparked by the skid plates underneath this stripper header. It's not the rotor spinning around on the thing. It was these hardened steel skids sparking off of rocks because it'll touch the ground every now and then as you're running close to the ground. And what we did is we just put poly covers on those. We bought our own. We had a machine shop cut the poly the right size for us, but they got us this high wear poly like they use in a grain elevator, and we just bolted that on those skids, and that totally eliminated that fire problem there. So... The other cool thing with the stripper header is with that drum just rolling, stripping the seeds off, if you have kochia in there, you can set it so that it strips the seeds but leaves most all the kochia intact. And so if we have a drought year and then you have weeds flush in in the fall, it's a real good way to cut through weed patches without having to pull those into your tank as well. So why are we working so hard at this? Obviously, there's some challenges in here. We've learned a lot that's actually easier. Like the stripper header is easier to run at harvest. It's easier on the combine and stuff. And it uses about half the fuel of the draper, but there has been some challenges too, which I'm going to get into in the next few slides. What we're doing is we're trying to add biology back to the soil that, that we're missing, right? And if you look at a PLFA test, it's a real good way to get a snapshot of where you're at on upper level stuff or fungal counts in your soil. Pretty much any of you guys that are in an intensive farming situation, all you have is bacteria left in the soil, which is where we started too. So we're using compost tea and extract out of our own local compost that we make here to apply all of these organisms back to the soil while we're seeding. So not only are we putting grain seed in the ground, 
through a liquid extract, we're also reseeding all of these organisms at the same time. And, and it's working. I'm going to show you in some tests here just how well. So we started um, with just thermal compost piles, which that's just laying a pile of stuff out on the ground and thermaling it, which means you would get it wet and then turn it every time and hit about 160 degrees. And you keep doing that, wetting it and turning it until it quits heating, and then you let it compost down that way. Well, that works fine, but you never get as good a biology as you do in a Johnson Sioux when you do that process, from what I can tell. So we are now big fans of these Johnson Sioux bioreactors. You just fill one of these IBC totes with some pipe in it. These pipes are in there for vent holes. After you fill them, um, they'll heat for a couple of days, and then you pull the pipes out, and then you're just left like the top left pitcher with holes in the compost that allow it to breathe. Because this is like a, an organism just like us that needs to breathe in and out, and the organisms, while they're multiplying, need to be able to vent and get oxygen. And if it gets anaerobic, you get bad bugs, not good, right? So if you want to learn more about that process, you can watch the Dr. David Johnson stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of good videos on how to do Johnson Sioux stuff, so. This is our extractor. Actually, then taking that Johnson Sioux when it's finished, about a year later, it'll be finished out. We put a pound an acre of that into five gallons of water, and that's what's getting applied to the field. But this is the machine that's making that liquid. So you can see here, it's bubbling really violently in the center of that filter. That strips the biology off of this compost and allows it outside of the filter. Anything outside this filter then is pumped out to the trailer, and that's what's put through our drill that we're using to reseed biology out into the field. With. So, worked really slick, actually. The beginning of figuring this out was frustrating because nobody could really tell us how to do it very well through the drill without plugging things up. I'm going to show you guys in this video how to avoid some of those issues. Um, Part of the reason we really like compost extract is you get a full spectrum of the soil food web. You're not paying a company like um, Bayer or Monsanto for one strain of bacteria, which they're charging whatever the market rate will give them, which seems to be 15 to 20 bucks an acre. It's pennies an acre worth of actual product of this compost extract because it's all local sourced waste things. So in our compost there that you just saw, there's waste wood chips from the fairgrounds from when the kids had 4-H. We let the, those are aged out there for a while so they don't have a piney smell anymore. The bale graze spots, so we bale graze our cattle. That means you put bales out on end and leave enough hay out for them to graze at least a week. As they're grazing that down, sometimes they'll leave a mat of hay there that um, we can go scoop up with a loader tractor and use that for compost. That has the manure. It's got all the protozoa and nematodes and stuff that came out of healthy cattle gut that's in that, plus some urine from when the cattle's urinated on that stuff, which is a good nitrogen source. Mixing that with about half wood chips and half that makes a really nice compost and really simple. So, But what we did find when we got into this system is that we were having some trouble with the nutrient cycling part. So if we were weaning off a fertilizer. If you go too far, the faster you wean off a of nitrogen, the quicker all this is probably going to start to work because the plant will stress and signal the biology to start working. But you're going to have some nitrogen deficiencies, and when you have that, you're going to have yield drag, right? So we found that using this bacteria out of Canada, out of advanced egg, really seems to be bridging that nutrient gap. This is a local company. They are um, they have a system very unique to themselves, which you're going to see in this video where they they actually set you up with your own compost tea um, setup. So it's going to heat the water. It's going to aerate the water. We're going to put bacteria into this solution and then feed it and then ramp it up to like a million times where we started. So this video anyways will walk you through that. Well, hey there, we, uh, we finally got started seeding anyways today after we got all this stuff put together, but I was going to explain some new stuff we're doing on the farm. So we actually are buying five different strains of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, nitrogen fixing and phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. It also does a whole bunch of different plant health stuff. There's these people out of Canada that started this and they're environmental engineers and we're using a lot of these bugs to clean ponds up and then they started trying to use them in agriculture and are getting really good results. So what we have here actually is a brewer. And so what you can see here, we've got a uh, hot tub heater, which is down there. It's got the 80 degree temperature thing on it and a recycling pump. So that pump is circulating water all the time through this big 3000 gallon tank. So we can brew 
about 3,000 gallons of bacteria, which is 1,500 acres here in about three days. And some of our neighbors are gonna try some of this too, so we're gonna um, sell some of that to them and, and then they're gonna try it and help us figure out if this is gonna work or not. But regardless, pretty cool system. So we're recirculating this through this basically swimming pool setup. It's gonna heat this water to 80 degrees. We're gonna add this bacteria in there, which we've already done one batch. We put some out in the drill this morning. And um, after we add the bacteria, we add some food into that thing, and that biology will ramp up to like a million times where we started. And we get a big flush of stuff that'll fix um, nitrogen and solubilized phosphorus, which are the two big elements that we really need in farming. And then uh, it does a whole bunch of other cool plant health things. So this is on top of the extract. We're still doing compost extract to get all that diversity and fungus back in there. But we're using this to bridge the gap between where we needed fertilizer before we hope we can pull the nitrogen out of the air and not actually have to pay for it. So like I said, that, that company is Advanced Egg. They're out of Canada. Neat, small family-owned thing that's ramped up to a pretty decent size now, but it's still a very um, small, intimate business, which I really like. It's, its research is all based in dryland Montana type situation, or in that instance is in Alberta, but it's just north of us. <clears throat> Fits our area really well. They've, we now got a product that went out to Kansas um, through them. I know that the guy's trying down there and seems to be having good luck with And I, I could see this. These strains of bacteria universally are good at doing things like solubilizing phosphorus. That's the reason we got such a huge release on that soil test I showed you guys at the beginning. They have a strain of bacteria in there that will actually pull carbon out of the air and sequester that in the soil. So taking CO2 and turning it into fixed carbon situation in the air, they've got strains of bacteria in there that fix nitrogen for all the plants, not just the um, not just the pulse crops, but the wheat and the barley and all those other plants too. It's able to take nitrogen out of the air and fix it and provide it in a form that the plant can use. So, this is the only product I found where they were able to get this many different forms of, of bacteria together into one jug. They sell you that in the jug, and then you ramp it up yourself in a compost um, tea, which there is no way to mimic that level of biology in a stabilized form, I don't think. So their process is pretty unique where they actually, you provide the water, they provide the bacteria and the food and it ramps itself up. So I'd look at that advancedegg.ca and if you guys are interested in talking more about that, we're actually a dealer for that down here now. We're not trying to get back into egg retail, but this is the one biological thing that I trust. And so if you guys are down in the States and are interested in this, just let us know. Anyways, there are some issues with putting liquid down at seeding specifically to the extract part, which I'm going to get into. So the first thing is when we do this extract, when we take it out of that Johnson Sioux, we got trained well enough in the microscope that at least we can identify if there's bad stuff in there like ciliates that would tell us that it, that compost had gone anaerobic. We want a certain number of fungal strands that we can find on that slide so that we know it's biocomplete in those Johnson Sioux's, it's pretty much assured that that's good stuff as long as it smells good. But we, we're good enough with the microscope, we can tell this is good when we're putting it down, right? We added the liquid kit um, to our drill. One thing I would change is we added all these little floaty ball things in here, which this is our manifold as well for the liquid system. That works great because it'll show us if one runs plug versus the other, but those tend to accumulate biology if the drill sits very long. Like if you have sunlight and clear um, tubes like this, if you leave any kind of biology sitting in there, they'll form a biofilm. So I, a stainless steel manifold would be a lot better for what we're doing versus this, I think. And, and that maybe with a flow meter on it so you could see if there was product flowing through it or not. Um, this is our drill setup over here. You can see there's a liquid cart being pulled by the drill. The ground drive pump in that cart, and it's just pumping it into this manifold at five gallons an acre, and then that goes out. to all of the points. We did have some issues with settling, especially with the first extractor that we had, but any compost extract you have is gonna have a lot of humics and a lot of 
small clay particles in it. Those are fine when they're in suspension. They'll go through this setup just fine. But if you let that tank sit, it'll settle out, it'll glom together, and then it'll slug your filters. And so what we do now is we'll just go out and we bubble that extract um, every morning. If there was some left in the tank, we'll bubble that before we start out. So we just took our air compressor onto a two-inch cam lock onto the bottom of the tank and bubble it. That fixed that problem. If we stop and we fill the drill, let's say, for 45 minutes or something, then we go bubble that before we take off, and that, that solves that problem. But if you don't bubble that extract and you let that sit, those particles that are free-floating in that water will eventually start attaching to each other, and you'll have some settling issues. Uh, the other thing is the freezing issues. Remember, this is actually just water, basically, that we're applying. So unlike liquid fertilizer, when we get below 32 degrees, this is going to freeze. We learned that the hard way a couple times in this setup, and now we just stop and blow out. If it's getting down to 30, the high 30s out, we probably better stop and blow this system out and and wait a couple days sometimes, but then you just go to moving on. Some guys are actually putting dry compost in their grain seed, and that would be another compromise for this. I think this extract in a lot of ways might be better from the amount of coverage that you can get, but applying dry compost in the seed is another wonderful solution because you don't have to deal with the liquid cart, a liquid setup on the tank, and you're still at least applying good compost with the seed. It should have all the same biology on it. Anyways, uh, this video just shows those clear sight gauges. We left them because we were going to replace them with new ones anyways. They were getting cloudy. We rinsed the drill out with water. It had some... I believe it was bleach in there to, we, we thought was going to sterilize it. But look at the biofilm that comes out of this just because we didn't clean that drill well enough. So we should have blown all of these out. It didn't matter, like I said, because we were going to replace them all anyways. But that's potentially what could happen if you didn't get your system clean enough when you shut down in the spring or the fall. So, so into the results. So this is more of what you guys probably are concerned about. How's this working? So. The NRCS is doing a bunch of tests on our EQIP projects. They, they provide PLFA tests for those, which is great, because those tests are awesome for tracking, like, your fungal counts. Um, Blue Dasher Farms, Jonathan Lundgren's Styles and Farm Initiative, as I've been out in our place, too. They are sampling quite a few of our fields, and they're going to do genetic sequencing of soil biology, so we'll know what strains of biology are surviving in this. Insect count and ID, water infiltration, compaction studies. Like, there's a lot of data being taken here so that we can make sure that this is is the best way to do this. And the cool thing with Jonathan Lundgren's thing is he, cause he's comparing us to neighbors that are doing regen just in a different way versus another guy doing it. And they're going to hopefully have good enough data to tell us what's working and what isn't, right? Um, this is one PLFA test of ours. You can see we're at above average to good on our our. Uh, our total biomass is very good, so we're at the top of the chart on that now, which is a major improvement from where we started. We're above average in the functional group index, but this fungal to bacteria thing, that's what we were really focusing on with that um, compost extract because it's you don't get stabilized fungus in a jug very often that it would do a good job. So when we did that compost extract a couple of years, we were able to get that all the way up to very good on the fungal counts, and so that's really encouraging that the work that we did is actually – reflecting back in these soil tests. Um, I was working with another neighbor. He has PLFA testing done too on his equip contract, and he's just starting a regen system. So just starting putting Johnson Sioux on his seed, basically, is what he's doing. And you can see in there, his soil is all bacterial, just as we would suspect, just like we started with when we were input intensive. So it'll be fun to watch this soil hopefully convert closer to what we have now just by using some of these biological products and getting away from the fertilizers and the fungicides. So the other thing you can notice in there is his total biomass index was below average and his functional group index very poor. So you'll see that. I'm, I'm sure if you go test any farmer's ground that is doing intense input stuff with the fungicide and the seed treat and all of that, these are all going to show up the same way. And it's encouraging to see just in two or three years we were able to improve our soils to the point that they're testing as good as they are now, um, just through extract and stuff. So now this was the same grower did monocrop peas versus intercrop. Interestingly enough there, he put Johnson Sioux on both of these seed on these, but he was still showing um, on the monocrop side, still pretty poor on the biological end much better on the intercropped. And then the fungal counts actually came up quite a bit higher where he intercropped peas and barley versus just the monocrop peas. So 
if we could insure this stuff, there would be no reason not to be doing intercropping on way more acres on our own farm too. It's just too high a risk at the moment. But it's obvious when you grow two or three or four plants together that they help each other out. And it helps the soil biology out a whole bunch too because you get all those different root exudates in there. These are, our, we do tissue sampling and all of our stuff just to verify that this is working. So this is with no applied starter fertilizer at tillering. So the plant's four to six inches tall. We've got uh, five to six leaves now on this plant and we are still totally sufficient in nitrogen with no applied nitrogen on all these fields. There's different crops in here. So there's flax, there's barley, there was peas in here, which you would assume would be sufficient on the PN. But regardless, on all of those crops and all the tissue snap samples that we took, we were sufficient last year. Some of that's the nitrogen cycling starting to work better just in general in the soil. I think a lot of that can be attributed to that advanced egg, that fun function focused bacteria that we are putting down now at two gallons an acre with the seed. So the phosphorus levels too. This is with no applied phos for three years in a row on these fields now. We are above the sufficiency level. Um, that the lab actually has for phosphorus there. So that's very encouraging too. That's with no applied phosphorus. And as you can see in those soil samples, we have a lot more free floating phosphorus than I have ever seen on a soil test when we were doing conventional eggs. So, so that's really encouraging too. We hit some drought stress. And of course you start getting a little nitrogen deficiency on some of these fields. When that happens, that, that's not unexpected. But in general, over half the farm was still sufficient in nitrogen, even without rain for about a month and a half in this scenario. So and then at the flag leaf stage two, here on the phosphorus end, we were sufficient pretty much across the board in phosphorus all the way up to flag leaf. So pretty encouraging that we can do that with no starter and, and soils that I should have explained. We have soils that are approaching 8 pH on a lot of this, which is usually a major tie up factor for phosphorus, right? Um, that's always been a big issue. The applied phosphorus, if we put fertilizer down 90% is tied up, 10% is taken up by the plant sometimes. So we are now getting, without any applied phosphorus, biology ramping up in the soil that's releasing it back to the plant, which is how nature said that should work anyways, right? If you apply a bunch of phosphorus with the seed and you go apply, let's say, this bacteria to try and release phosphorus, phosphorus-applied fertilizer to the seed is going to make the seed lazy or the plant lazy, and it's not going to ex excrete exudates that signal that bacteria to go to work. So if you're going to do this stuff, I think the reason we're having such good luck, like with this advanced egg bacteria really showing a bunch of big bumps in here is because we're not applying a bunch of other fertilizer that's making the plant lazy. The plant the plant knows it's stress. We need a little bit of plant stress for exudates to stimulate the stuff to start to happen, right? Um, like I said, that Thousand Farms Initiative has been sampling stuff all over on our farm that, that's good because they're going to give us good solid data and they're going to help us hopefully get intercropping insured too, which would be a big deal. We're seeing a lot more root exudates. These are peas on the left side that had Johnson Sioux and folic acid applied to them and look at the root mass and the exudates that we're getting on, on that stuff. For a product in that scenario, that Johnson Sioux and that fulvic acid is less than 50 cents an acre worth of stuff that we're putting on the seed. So that's uh, encouraging. And we just can see a lot of things changing in the ground, whether it's some um, soil aggregate reports that we get back from the NRCS too that are getting way better um, the smell of the soil, the texture, all of it's improving. We just need a wet year to really prove out the system to see if it'll fall in its face or not, I guess. Just real quickly, we only got a couple slides left, but we obviously integrating livestock back into our farm too as much as we can. We did a bunch of water line that'll allow cattle to be all over on our owned, on our ground that we actually physically own, which is good. So now we can cover about 3,000 acres or 2,500 acres of ground with cattle, which is a big improvement over what we had. We downsized the frame side of our of our cows. Those were on our end of it. It was done using moderator cows, which are Aberdeen bulls bred back to Angus cows, which give us moderators. Aberdeen is old blood Angus, some line bred Angus back from uh, way back in Australia when they did some experiment stuff comparing smaller frame to larger frame cattle. So you get a lot of the good old genetics in there, which is tough cattle that can can hold body condition well into the winter. Um, you don't have as many flies or lice. There's a lot of good things that happen with some of this older genetics that wasn't just focused on high weaning weights anyways. But but anyways, we downsized our cattle frame size. We changed our calving to May 15th. That made a huge difference the amount of labor in this. We don't tag calves anymore. They're just out on green grass calving. 
The top pitcher is what we're dealing with right now. We were dumb enough to go buy some heifers, and we're calving in March again here just a little bit. But 16 head of calves in March is the same work pretty much as 50 head of calves is in March, and it gives us a good reminder of why we don't want to calve in the winter anymore. For the most part, our calving is out while we're intensive grazing now on green grass. The cows are moving every day onto a a clean set of grass, which is good for disease. The cows are eating high nutrient dense food at the time they're calving, which is better in general for the cows. Um, People told us when we switched to May calving, you can't do that because they won't breed up. Well, we had 100% breed up on, we only have about 60 head of cows left now, but we're building that back up. But regardless on 60 head, we had 100% breed up at preg check with only two late cows in, in 23. So That was with the bulls working in August where they said that was impossible. So that part is totally fine. I can see that could work. I guess if you were in big country where the bulls are traveling a bunch, it would be different than where we're keeping these cattle grouped up too. But, um, and then in 23, zero death loss. So we we were 60 for 60 or whatever we had on cows calved out, zero assisted births. We didn't have any heifers that year. So that explains the zero assisted births. But regardless, when we're calving on grass, we're able to keep these cows either closer to the barn, maybe within a mile of the barn, so we can walk one back if we need to. Or we have a portable corral set up that we can move if we get farther away than that, and we can catch one or bring it back to the barn if something goes wrong. But in general, our calving problems were, I bet you, cut down to a tenth of what we had when we calved in the winter. Obviously, between the, the froze calves, the sick calves, when you're calving in a corral, the potential for scours, all of the things that go along with calving in the winter go away when you get to calving on green grass. And that is the best change we ever made on this place on the livestock end of things. Uh, the other thing that was a, a real eye opener to us is we switched when we used to buy yearlings and bring them in and we'd have maybe 10 different people's cattle here that we would then go run on grass. But when we were weaning those yearlings, we'd have a lot get sick. And that was in our old system where we'd bring the yearlings in, we would pour them, we'd still vaccinate them, but they were on just lick tubs, which is chelated mineral. When we switched to using multi men as, as an injectable mineral to kind of so that stuff has zinc, um, manganese, copper, and selenium in it, I think. And that, that multi-min covers the spectrum of what we potentially would have for mineral problems up here where we live, at least. And that one year that we did that, when we started using multi-min, we went from doctoring 10 to 15% of those yearlings down to none, literally, that got like a respiratory disease. And you're like, holy cow, what could we do with micros in cattle, Right. If you read Pat Colby's Natural Cattle Health book, I think is what it's called. So look up Pat Colby, Natural Cattle Health. That is the best book you will read, I think, ever on minerals and cattle. And we switched to an all-natural mineral system down here. So we have three a three-part mineral feeder. There's Redmond salt now where the white salt's at in this mineral feeder, a natural source of cattle mineral, which Pat Colby will teach you how to make your own if you want. A lot of that's calcium carbonate, um, things that are naturally taken in by cattle, but then if they don't need it, that doesn't get forced in their body like chelated stuff. And then we like using kelp or seaweed in this third part of this. And sometimes uh, if they're on green grass, maybe they don't eat much of the kelp, but they use more of the mineral. If they get on tougher stuff, they might eat more of the kelp and less of the mineral or more salt. But the thing is the cattle can balance themselves out. And our cattle health problems have pretty much gone away since we've changed our mineral program, which is super encouraging too. This intensive grazing, quickest return thing you could do on a farm is start moving cattle more often across that. So if you look on the left here, this is our barley crop in 21. Severe drought, about two inches of rain for the entire crop year up all the way till July. It had been hot. The barley had sloughed all its tillers. On the right, that's the same day that that picture was taken. We had already intensive grazed across this grass back in May. And this is the regrowth we had in that intensive grade system versus the crop system over here um, on June 27th to 21. So just real quick, like this slide shows an experiment they did where they cut grass 
every week. So that'd be leaving cattle in a pasture all spring or all year, right? Where they just keep cutting it off and the amount of root growth or the roots that are underneath that. This is cut every two weeks in the middle and then a four week break on the right side. And you can see the difference in the root mass, the, the ability of that grass to recover because all of its energy is in those roots. If you can get on that grass and get back off of it and give it a longer recovery period, you're gonna have a lot more biomass production. If you're in a, a system where you just turn cattle out in the same pastures every year and just leave them there all year, you're going to end up with grass like this, and it's going to take it some time to recover. So that, that's going to need a long rest or at least some animal impact on it and then get back off of it. So we did a lot of water improvement stuff. We ran about five miles of water line north to south through this farm, which is going to help a lot with um, covering more of this with cattle. We did all tire tanks because those are a lifetime cattle tank, which is awesome. You level those things, fill the middle with gravel, and pour cement in the middle. Just a couple of things to note here. Um, this is our overflow pipe, this white pipe coming up through the middle. If you put a collar on that so you can pull it off, then you can drain the tank using the overflow pipe too. So that's was a good tip that we learned in this. Um, we drill leg bolts into the side of this tank, into the bead. Those leg bolts allow the cement a place to attach to. So if it shrinks a little bit, the tank follows it. That was, uh, we learned from a guy in Nebraska. So thanks for that pointer. And then after you pour the cement in the middle of these tanks and level it, fill that tank with water and keep about a foot of water on top of that cement. And that will really help that cement cure without cracking. So just some pointers we learned while we did that project. On our cover crop mixes, we're just trying to keep higher carbon stuff in our cover crop mix. Things like forage peas and uh, turnips and radishes and vets, those are all great because they, they are high protein and they look great in your mix, but they won't leave any cover the next year. And now that we've added a higher percentage of oats or triticale or grass into these mixes, we're getting so much more cover left after we graze across it. So really watch your carbon to nitrogen ratio in those mixes. This on the left side shows our 2020 cover crop with a lot of oats in it. This is a, another dry year and you can see the amount of biomass growth we got just because of quorum sensing in the cover crops. And then with the cover that we were able to leave after we intensive grazed across that, because we have all that high carbon stuff laid down on the ground. And then this just shows the turnips and radishes coming back in this system. And it's still feeding uh, energy into the ground, still breaking up compaction after we've grazed across it already, right? So ideal. That was an ideal cover crop situation that we had there. We were able to graze across it open up some sunlight for the stuff underneath that started coming back and it's kept feeding energy into that soil until the fall. So what to watch for in cover crop uh, nitrate, especially in drought, we found kochia patches, especially are bad for this. So if you see the cover crop around an alkali spot and you've got a bunch of kochia coming, don't make them graze that cover crop down to the point that they're going to go start wanting to eat that kochia. They, they won't touch the kochia usually until there's not a lot of good, other good options there, but that kosher is going to be really high in nitrate. And we've lost at least one or two calves that way and a cow just in high nitrate kosher. And I nitrate tested that with our tester last year. We have one of those Ariba ones, and it was 7,500 parts per million, so dangerously high. Um, warm season grasses can get prussic acid in them. Also, flats that's still green can be high in prussic acid. So one thing we screwed up this year, we seeded a lot of our ground that we have fenced for fall grazing that we normally would graze crop aftermath on. It was all seeded to flax. That stuff stayed green way into the fall. So we weren't able to utilize that until it froze off and browned up this winter. So be cognizant of what you're seeding in there, that there could be prussic acid problems in warm season grasses like sorghum or millet. We found out you can actually test for that. There's a video on YouTube you can watch. If you look up cytismal paper and prussic acid, I think, you can use the cytismal paper in a Ziploc bag with that forage. And if it turns blue with the forage trapped in that Ziploc bag with that paper, then you've got a prussic acid problem. If it doesn't turn blue, then it's probably safe. And then don't overgraze it because the whole point of cover crop is to leave cover. I mean, there's the soil health portion of it for what it's doing under the ground, but leaving cover too is a big part of it. This bale grazing has been a big home run for us. Um, we only have to feed once a week. Just for us, we figured if we were starting a tractor and only feeding a couple bales a day, it was costing us 50 to 100 bucks a day to have that tractor start, warm up when it's cold, for an employee to go out there and feed. So we could waste, oftentimes, nearly a bale of hay per day. We could be wasting, possibly, and be less money than what it's costing to run that tractor. So you're not going to have near that much waste in this bale grazing, but it is going to leave some waste. It'll probably leave six inches of stuff. 
on the ground that the cows don't pick up. But as that breaks down, and, and if you leave too much of this, it's going to take three or four years to that for that to cycle into here. But as that breaks down, you can see these green spots in this pasture are all bale gray spots, and the brown spots are where it hasn't been bale grazed yet. We get such a high return on the amount of forage that comes back. The cost of labor of feeding goes way down, and we've just been real happy with how this has worked out, at least on our operation. So. The last thing, if you're going to make cattle work, you have to have dung beetles working for you. And if you're pouring cattle with Ivamec or Cydectin, they say Cydectin's safer, but that still is an internal insecticide that's getting into the cattle. I don't think it's as hard on the dung beetles, but it's still going to be hard on biology. There's really no reason you should have to be, pour, be pouring cattle if you're not confining them in a dry lot where they're going to get worms, or you're not confining them in one pasture the whole summer where they're they're grazing drought stressed or, or nutrient stressed plants. We haven't poured our cattle for a good 10 years here and have not had any issues. So I think point taken is if you get into this system where your cattle are healthier, they're, they're calving on green grass, they're not stuck in dry lots most of the year, you can not pour the cattle and then you'll end up with dung beetle counts like this. And the dung beetles are super important for cycling nutrients in your pasture back into the ground. So this was one day after this paddy was dropped and we were grazing cover crop for a neighbor, this was an organic field being back, transitioned back to conventional, but you can see the dung beetle count in here. It's pretty remarkable. In a system like that, they will cycle that dung back into the ground in a matter of like three to four days, you won't find that path there anymore, which is what we want. One more thing to note on dung beetles, if you go out in the spring and you try looking for them and the ground still froze, you're not gonna find them because they're not um, active yet. As it warms up, they should become more active. So don't be disheartened if you go out early in the spring and don't find dung beetles, even though you're not pouring the cattle anymore. It's going to take some heat to get them going. Um, we're about to the last slide here. The weed control with mowing has been a big home run for us. Kosha, I love from the fact of its, its effect remediating the soil. And so if we let kosha grow up with our perennial crops and we're seeding them, which is what we're doing here now, Underneath there, they're all, almost like clockwork be a fully established perennial stand. So they grow together. It's, it's strange how the kochia almost kind of helps this process. They'll grow up together. If you let that kochia grow till it's pollinating, which that would be if you go out and you drive through it and you're side by side and it's getting your vehicle orange, it's pollinating in the fall. Um, if you mow it while it's pollinating, it's not going to set seed. It's going to put that kochia back where it came from. And kochia is what's called autotoxic, where it doesn't like to grow back where it, it previously was. And we let that kochia remediate that soil to the best of its ability. So this kochia actually, while it's a detriment in our annual cropping system, has become a tool in our perennial cropping system. And that's just part of our remediating the soil, cycling these into perennials for several years, and letting nature kind of fix itself. So you can see this is mowing that kochia. And we just have a 10-foot Schulte mower. You can do quite a bit at 7 miles an hour with one of these mowers, and those things will mow through tall stuff. So, so that's controlling that. is right so thank you so much for listening to this whole presentation we'll have more data next year hopefully it's wetter next year we're going to do a, a few more splits with that bacteria versus not um, we're going to go forward with we're treating our seed with johnson sue and fulvic acid and then we're putting bacteria down at two gallons an acre through the drill and that seems to be a real good combination but if um you guys have any comments you can comment on this youtube video or on this facebook post or you can always be, feel free to contact me if you scan this QR code on your screen, it'll actually add me as a contact. It'll have my cell phone number and my email address. And I always love to talk through this with people. We will learn so much from each other. Like we always say, there's no textbook for this stuff, right? And we're figuring it out together, but it's it's working. And, and I can see our farm going in a better direction, and that's exciting. So thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this. And I'm excited to kind of make videos as we go about the year this year and show you how things are progressing.